Today, the negative equity trap. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. The RBA released their financial stability report today. And even with the rose-tinted RBA glasses, there are a number of worrying issues touched on. Although none new. But their analysis of negative equity is over-optimistic. So we will look at what they say and highlight some additional considerations. But more broadly, the RBA said that domestic economic conditions remain broadly supportive of financial stability. So that's all right. Then. The unemployment rate has remained around 5% since the previous review, and corporate profit growth has also been strong. However, GDP growth in Australia also slowed in the second half of 2018, and in particular, consumption growth eased, and the outlook for consumption is, they say, uncertain. Conditions in the housing market remain weak. Nationally, housing prices are 7% below their late 2017 peak, although they are still almost 30% higher since the start of 2013. And growth in housing credit was slightly lower over the six months to February than the preceding half year, with investor credit hardly growing at all. Nationally, falling housing prices have been driven by weaker demand and increased housing supply, they say. The tightening in the supply of housing credit from improved lending standards has played, they say, a smaller part. By the way, we think that's incorrect. We think that's the main lever. Importantly, these more rigorous lending standards have seen the quality of new loans improve in recent years, and measures of financial stress among households are generally low, and households remain well-placed to service their debt, given low unemployment, low interest rates, and improvements to lending standards. But again, we question whether that's correct. However, they say there has been an increase in housing loan arrears rates. And the increase in arrears has been largest in Western Australia, where the decline in mining related activity has seen housing prices fall for nearly five years and unemployment increase. Then they did a deep dive on negative equity using their securitized loan data. And they said large housing price falls in parts of Australia mean some borrowers are facing negative equity, where the outstanding balance on the loan exceeds the value of the property it is secured against. Negative equity creates vulnerabilities both for borrowers and lenders. A borrower having difficulty making loan repayments who has negative equity cannot fully repay their debt by selling the property. And negative equity also implies that banks are likely to bear losses in the event that a borrower defaults. Evidence from Australia and from abroad suggests that borrowers who experience an unexpected fall in income are more likely to default if their loan is in negative equity. At present, they say, the incidence of negative equity remains low. Given the large increases in housing prices that preceded recent falls and the decline in the share of mortgages issued with high loan-to-value ratios, housing prices would need to fall significantly further for negative equity to become widespread, they said. However, even if this did occur, increased defaults would be unlikely if the unemployment rate remains low, particularly given the improvements in loan serviceability standards over recent years. Estimating the share of borrowers with negative equity requires data on current loan balances and property values. The RBA securitization data set contains the most extensive and timely data on loan balances and purchase prices, well, perhaps other than the DFA database. <laughs> 
The securitization data set includes about one quarter of all the value of all residential mortgages or about 1.7 million mortgages. And this data can be combined with regional data on housing price movements to estimate the share of loans that are currently in negative equity. This suggests that nationally, around two and three quarter percent of securitized loans by value are in negative equity, just over 2% of borrowers. The highest rates of negative equity are in Western Australia, the Northern Territory and Queensland, where there have been large price falls in areas with high exposure to mining activity. Almost 60% of loans with negative equity are in Western Australia or the Northern Territory. Rates of negative equity in other states remain very low. And estimates of negative equity from the securitization data set may, they say, however, be over or understated. They could be understated because securitized loans are skewed towards those with lower LVRs at origination. And in contrast, the higher prevalence of new loans in the data set compared to the broader population of loans and not being able to take into account capital improvements on values will work in the other direction. And I'd add to that that there is a discussion to be had about whether you're looking at one specific loan relating to the property or the total property exposure of a particular household with all the loans against the properties they hold. Now, that's how we calculate the particular data sets that we use and why we think that the property issues are higher than the RBA. But the RBA is taking a narrow definition and is looking at it from a loan portfolio perspective. And they say some private surveys estimate closest to 10% of mortgage holders are in negative equity. However, they say the surveys are likely to be an overestimate for a number of reasons. For instance, by not accounting for offset account balances. Now, DFA, of course, estimates 10% of households are in negative equity after taking offset balances into account and also adding in the current for sale value of the property and transaction costs. And then the RBA goes on to say information from bank liaison and estimates based on the 2017 data from the Household Incomes and Labour Dynamics of Australia, the HILDA survey, suggests rates of negative equity are broadly in line with those from the securitization data set. Now, I have to say that the HILDA data is at least two years old, so before the recent price falls, so this will underestimate and understate the current position. They say, the continuing low rates of negative equity outside the mining exposed regions reflect three main factors. Firstly, previous substantial increases in home prices, the low share of housing written at high loan to value ratios, and the fact that many households are ahead on their loans, having accumulated extra principal payments. Housing prices in some areas of Sydney and Melbourne have fallen by upwards of 20% from their peak in mid to late 2017, but only a small share of owners purchased at peak times and many others experienced price rises before property prices began to fall. And properties purchased in Sydney and Melbourne since prices peaked account for around 2% of the national dwelling stock. Looking further back, properties purchased in the two cities since prices were last at the current level still only account for around 4.5% of the dwelling stock and few recent borrowers had high starting loan-to-value ratios. Over the past five years, loans issued by ADIs with LVRs above 90% have roughly halved since 2017. It has averaged less than 7%. Around 80% of ADI loans are issued with an LVR of 80% or less, and around 15% of unoccupied borrowers and 20% of investors have a starting LVR of exactly 80%. Given most borrowers do not have high starting LVRs, they say housing price falls need to be large for widespread negative equity. Only 15% of regions have experienced price declines of 20% or more from their peaks. Around 90% of these regions are in Western Australia, Queensland and the Northern Territory. If a borrower has paid off some of their debt, then price declines will need to be larger still for them to be in negative equity. And most borrowers have principal and interest loans that require them to pay down their debt 
and many borrowers are ahead on their repayment schedule. Around 70% of loans are estimated to be at least one month ahead of their payment schedule, with around 30% ahead by two years or more. When a borrower is behind on repayments and their loan is in negative equity, banks classify the loans as impaired. And banks are required to raise provisions against potential losses from impaired loans through bad and doubtful debt charges. Currently, the proportion of impaired housing loans is very low at 0.2% of all residential mortgages, despite having increased of late. Queensland, Western Australia and the Northern Territory together account for around 90% of all mortgage debt in negative equity. And these states have regions that experience large and persistent housing price falls over several years. This has often been coupled with low income growth and increases unemployment, which have reduced the ability of borrowers to pay down their loans. Loans currently in negative equity were on average taken out around five years ago and have higher average LVRs at origination of around 85%. This made them particularly susceptible to subsequent falls in property values. Investment loans are also disproportionately represented despite typically having lower starting LVRs than owner-occupied loans. Investors are more likely to take out interest-only loans in order to keep their loan balance high for tax purposes. And around 10% of loans in negative equity have interest-only terms expiring in 2019, which is double the share for loans in positive equity. For these borrowers, the increase in repayments from moving to principal and interest may be difficult to manage, especially as loans in negative equity are already more likely to be in arrears. Having more borrowers in this scenario is distressing for the borrowers themselves and for the communities they live in. However, it is, they say, unlikely to represent a risk to broader financial stability, given it remains largely restricted to mining exposed regions, which represent a very small share of total mortgage debt. Continued housing price falls, they said, would be expected to increase the incidence of negative equity, particularly if they affect borrowers with already high LVRs. Around one and a quarter percent of loans by number and one and three quarter percent of loans by value have a current LVR between 95 and 100, making them likely to move into negative equity if there were further housing price falls. However, compared to the international experience with negative equity during large property downturns, the incidence of negative equity in Australia is likely to remain low. Negative equity peaked in the United States at over 25% of mortgaged properties in 2012, and in Ireland it exceeded 35% as peak to trough price falls exceeded 30 and 50% respectively. And by the way, it's worth noting that this was about two and a half to three years later than the financial crisis itself. And that is something to bear in mind because it takes time for this to work through the system. However, the RBA says high origination LVRs were far more common in these countries than they have been in Australia. To which I reply, except we know that there were high levels of mortgage fraud and incorrect data supporting loan applications here, much higher than, for example, in Ireland. And they say even if negative equity was to become more common in the larger housing markets of Sydney and Melbourne, impairment rates for banks are unlikely to increase significantly while unemployment and interest rates remain low. To which I reply, yes, you need to get postcode granular to see what is really going on. And our earlier post went into significant detail here down to postcode through our heat maps. But I want to also make another point, and that is that households who are in negative equity will hunker down, will spend less, and potentially will try and pay down their mortgage faster. So the broader financial and economic impact of negative equity is not just in direct financial stability, but it directly flows on to slower GDP.
And if you overlay my 10% negative equity scenario, based on what I think is the true picture, if you take into account real property price values and real households, not just individual loan, then this has a significant risk to the broader economy, individual households, and indeed banks. So I conclude that the Reserve Bank is definitely playing down negative equity as an issue and is using a selective set of data from securitized pools to make their point. I think the truth is probably significantly more worrying. If you found this post useful, please like it, share it, add a comment or question. And if you haven't yet subscribed to receive alerts for future posts, do so now. And if you have already subscribed, many thanks. I appreciate your support and participation. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.